Hi everyone and welcome to our seminar entitled Reliable Testing Solutions for Personal Protective Equipment or PPE, Medical Textiles and Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for investing the time to attend our webinar. My name is David Phillips and I'm responsible for market intelligence in the Zwickroll Group. With the emergence of the COVID-19 crisis, the whole world was and still is faced with a shortage of personal protective equipment, especially face masks. Also in future, the demand for PPE will continue to rise. Therefore, testing solutions are required to ensure the quality and safety of products. This need for reliable testing solutions is not only limited to PPE. Other medical products in daily life, for example, medical textiles and uh, medical and pharmaceutical packaging, are critical for patient safety and thus must also be tested. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, we have been contacted by medical or by many medical and pharmaceutical companies. Some of them have to upscale their existing production and others want to start producing products to support the pandemic emergency actions. Within this webinar, you will learn about Zwickroll's standard testing solutions for a wide range of PPE, medical textiles, packaging applications, and hopefully you'll understand the critical factors uh, in obtaining reliable test results. Just before we get started, let me remind you that we will be taking some questions at the end of the webinar, and you can submit these using the Q&A function, which you'll find on the GoToWebinar panel on the right of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as possible, uh, but any that we are not able to cover will be answered personally by email. So now I'd like to introduce my expert colleague for today's webinar. Jochen Niederberger is our business development manager for the medical and pharmaceutical industry. He will share his experience and insights about materials testing with you today. So Jochen, welcome to the webinar. Can I suggest um, we start with personal protection equipment, uh, otherwise known as PPE. And before actually talking about testing solutions, could you please give us a quick overview of PPE in general? Well, David, um, first of all, thank you for the introduction and a warm welcome from my side. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to, to give you and our listeners uh, insights into the testing of these products. So PPE is, is definitely a good start because nowadays it's a hot topic uh, due to the huge shortage we all had to discover. Um, let me start with the purpose of the personal protective equipment. It's already in the name, but it shall protect the wearer's body from injury or infection. This can be electricity, heat, chemical or biohazard matters, let's say. And when we look at doctors or care or home care, we can see four types of PPE that are relevant, especially in the, especially when facing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So first, we have uh, all kinds of protective masks. So this can reach from easy self-made mouth, mouth, nose protection, like we have to wear it uh, in nearly all the states right now, to mask with and without valves that meet the highest available, available protection classes, FFP2, FFP3. Uh, second, we have face shields. Um, there's also interesting to learn that there's quite a lot of networking and collaboration going on. There are 3D printing companies joining the production of such face shields. Third, we have protective clothing, such as surgical gowns. And fourth, we have medical gloves made of latex, nitrile, that means latex-free, or, or even cheap, cheaper material like vinyl. And let me add one more comment. Um, we talk about PPE, but at the same time, these products can also be medical products. And this has a huge influence from the regulatory standpoint. So there, the stricter, in my, in my opinion, stricter regulations are valid. And the major difference is that the products will not protect the wearer, but it shall protect the patient in the end to, to be get not injured, infected, or, or harmed at all. Okay, thank you. That's a... That's a really useful overview, I think. That so, could you could you go into a little bit of detail about the mechanical testing of these products? For example, which international standards might apply? 
Yeah, for sure. So when you look at the products, we have various standards for all kind of kind of product and testing is an essential part of that because the products have to undergo testing according to FDA or, or EMA guidelines before they can be sold to the market. Um, when we go deeper into the standards, we see that the majority of the testing is to test the permeability, the filtration cap capability, or also the flammability. So not mechanical tests, but they are also mechanical testing in, uh, and this is important to demonstrate the proper functioning of the products. And uh, this can be done either for the whole products or for, for its components. Okay, so we understand that there are some um, standardized tests for mechanical testing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the different kinds of mechanical tests which have to be carried out? Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Um, I would like to start with the medical gloves. Um, and when we look at them, for sure, if you if you wear them and you tear them when you pull something, um, like holding a, a sharp tool or other instruments, uh, yeah, it shall shall not tear, and and that's why these these gloves must have a an, a sufficient elastic behavior, let's say, and uh, therefore tear strength tests are, are commonly used for for gloves for different type with and without a seam, and also for artici artificially uh, aged gloves, and. Uh, by the way, it's not done what you can see on the on the right picture for the full glove. So there has to be a sam sample preparation according to ISO 37 that there must be three dumbbell shaped uh, specimen that are punched out of the, of the glove from the palm, from the back, from the cuff. And uh, this has to be done parallel to the longitudinal axis. So David, you can see, um, Specimen preparation is already an essential part for getting reliable testing results later on. Once you have the sample prepared, then you can insert them into, into the specimen grips, for instance, of our Zwickelroll uh, test uh, testing machine, which you can see on the on the left side. Okay, so that's that's a good overview of gloves. Um, I'd like to move the topic a little bit in a different direction now. So as, as we see um, every day around us, there are a lot of people wearing masks now in public. Can you can you tell us a bit more about what types of tests are carried out on, on these products? And you can imagine that masks also have to be tested. Um, and this is not new, so we have done that for years now, but for sure due to COVID-19, uh, there's a huge increase and we see a, a steadily uh, higher demand for, for testing. The testing can be done either for raw material, it can be done for components, it can be done for, for let's say, samples cut it out from the whole mask itself. And when we start with the raw material, we, we saw, see that it's possible with our M-Flow tester. So here we define the MFR values uh, that are critical for the manufacturing process. So it's really important to understand the material characteristics uh, before going into manufacturing. And what we currently see is, is really a high demand for such testing of MFR values in the Asian region, especially in China. For sure, they are, they are the major producers of, of such masks. Um, the second point is we, we can see uh, in the bottom, we have tensile tests um, on, on samples cut out, out of mask according to ASTM D534 or even tensile tests on the mask band where we test the connection from the band to, to the mask body. And typically um, there's a force which uh, shall not be less than 10 Newton that must be achieved. On the right side, you see another test, is a test example is the tear growth test. And this is extremely important because we, the tests are done on non-woven textiles, which are important for the filtration as well. Um, and there we have one method, which is uh, possible. We have the Drowser method, also called Tong uh, procedure, according to ASTM D5735. Um, but there's also a possibility to make tear growth strength tests uh, on trapezoid uh, specimen, according to AI in, uh, in ISO 973-4 or ASTM 5733. Uh, 
and for sure if you have this mask on um, it gets wet so the testing is not only limited to to the dry state but also to wet state and this wet uh, testing of wet specimen is let's say only described in the ASDM standards okay so um protective masks then are, are made from non-woven textiles and I, and I know that a lot of other products are, are also produced from textiles so for example elastic textiles for compression therapy um, plastic casts for treating wounds uh, as well as surgical textiles what, what testing is required for these materials and, and these products uh, Jochen? Yeah we this is a quite huge topic, David, uh, that you mentioned. And uh, we at Swig World, we work in this segment, we call it medical textiles for, for quite a long time, let's say decades now. And during that time, we have developed a lot of standardized, but also customized solutions for example, for textiles, for patients, for plasters, for modern wound treatment, for compressors and surgical sutures. So to give our listeners an impression, I brought three um, testing solutions with me. So I want to start with a tensile test on gauze bandages according to again our ASTM D534. Um, yeah this is uh, a standard test and and it's mainly done um, to test the behavior of the, the tensile force. Um, which I find more interesting is the unrolling test and they are really the unrolling behavior of gauze bandages are tested. And this is necessary because often, let's say, individual fibers um, block or prevent reliable unrolling. And therefore, with measuring the force, we can measure that, uh, that unrolling behavior. And that, that way, we, do, we use a 10 kilonewton Swick Roll Materials testing machine with a motor-driven unrolling unit. And this is... Uh, this unit is not limited to gauze bandages, so there would be also a pull-off test on blasters, band-aids or strips would be possible. And the last example I want to share with you is um, also an interesting one from my, my feeling, is the measurement of the adhesive force of wound dressings. From the left picture with the metal plate, you see how, it, how the standard EN1939 describes it. So, it, it is uh, put on the metal plate and then it's pulled off. And this can be performed at various angles. Um, but you can imagine that the forces here on the metal plate are totally different and have nothing to do with the reality. So they are about 20, 25 times higher than if you do it with a, uh, from the skin. And that's why manufacturers uh, go for the right picture. Um, also to, let's say, test on natural skin, they want to detect if there's any sensation of pain uh, by the patient or any skin irritation by the adhesive uh, that is used within these uh, these uh, dressings. Okay, thank you, uh, Jochen. I think, uh, I think that's a useful um, amount of information there about PPE and textiles. I'd like, if possible, to move our topic now a little bit again in a, in a different direction and towards the subject of of packaging. Um, recently, I've heard people refer to to uh, primary and secondary packaging, and maybe some of our participants today are also interested in this topic. Um, could you give us a little more clarity on, on this, uh, please? Yeah, the difference is really important. Um, so we distinguish primary, secondary, and, and even tertiary packaging. It, it always depends on, on to whom you speak, which customer you are involved. Um, so primary packaging is the package packing that is dire in direct physical contact uh, with a product, with a drug or sausage form in, in the pharmaceutical context, whereas the secondary packaging and the tertiary ter packaging are not. And uh, I want to demonstrate it in, in two examples that is also visible that uh, it depends on the product whether a packaging type is primary or secondary. So the syringe, you can see that the empty syringe is the primary packaging and the blister pack where several syringes are, are packed uh, is, is the secondary one. And the cardboard where, where let's say this blister pack goes in is can be seen as tertiary packaging. Whereas for the pill, we have the blister pack which 
would be Rhymer packaging, direct contact to the pill, and the cardboard would be the secondary one. Okay, now I understand the difference. Okay, so so um, in that case, then what are what are the typical mechanical tests which would be carried out on on packaging? Uh, David, this is also not so easy to to say because. Uh, as the medical textiles is quite a huge range, so we have so many different kind of packaging. Uh, we learned primary and secondary one, so it's it's not so easy. And and what I also want to do, I want to give you some examples uh, that might give you an impression about which standard solutions we have right now, and for sure we can also go for customized solutions. And I would like to start with the testing of uh, of ampoules. So we have snap of ampoules with a breakpoint, and therefore we have de uh, developed a universal three-point flexure kit, uh, and this allows testing of ampoules of various sizes. Uh, so that means, for instance, uh, ampoules of one, one to two ml, three ml, five ml, or ten ml uh, ampoules, and this can be done with the same uh, unit. So this it's adjustable, and this makes it really interesting. Um, because David, you see, flexible solutions are really important because without adjustment, you would have to exchange the whole unit when you have a different ample size. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thank you for that. Um, are there other examples of, of primary packaging that you can share with us today? Yes, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, determination of the residual seal force, which I find is really interesting. Um, I know that's a complex topic, so that's why I would like to give you first some background information. Um, because this residual seal force allows to, to get an indirect conclusion about the security of the vial closure. And this is really important because it, it has a, gives us some information about the integrity of the primary packaging. And you can imagine once there is a, a leakage or whatever, uh, the drug is maybe not able to help people. So it's a severe topic. And that's why uh, also the PDA has written a technical report, it's number 27, that where they really uh, go, went for methods that are uh, shall be done for the container closure integrity testing. And these methods could be a bubble test, a dye leak test, a helium leak test. Um, and based on these testing, for the vials, you can understand whether your your integrity is good or bad. And the point is, um, the tests are long lasting and that's, they are expensive. And the biggest, uh, let's say, problem is that it's not possible to to get a quick determination um, of the values. And there, our solution, our testing solution, is really interesting because we can quickly determine. So about 10 seconds after, six seconds after the test, whether the seal force is good or the sealing is good, the integrity is good or, or bad. Um, because when we talk about residual seal force as a definition, we talk about the, the force with which the rubber stopper, this is the yellow uh, highlighted or colored uh, point in, on, on, this, uh, on the slide, um, between the flange cap and the neck of the vial is braced. So it was pushed into the vial and has a certain, let's say, uh, force which is applicable. And uh, how does it work now? To, you do the testing according to the test methods that are described. You choose one, two, whatever you want to do. You get, for a vial, you get a result, whether you know it's good or bad. And then you do the testing with the same vial with our, with our testing machine and get a value as well. And so you can really do a correlation and you get the value, you get the limits. And maybe some more details about the testing. So how does the test look like? So first of all, you have to remove um, the safety cap from the closure before the testing. And then you, you put, you press on, on the rim of the flange cap and the, as long as the force for the stopper is bigger than the force which goes down for the compression, everything is fine. It's, it's, let's say it's sealed or it's, uh, it's secure. 
But once the compression load is higher than the force from the stopper, there's a lifting from the neck of the vial. And this lifting has an impact on the force travel diagram where we can really see a reduction. And this inflection point is the RSF value. So I hope, um, I know it's such a complex topic that I could, could uh, give you some more insights about that. And for sure, if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to, to discuss that with you. Thanks, Jacques. And I think a good explanation. It's a, it's a clearly complex uh, test to carry out, but uh, you already know how to do it. Um, so we, we can all recognize the importance there, then of, of the container uh, closure integrity. And we can all see that testing is, is vitally important for the quality of, of such primary packaging. Um, Another very popular package uh, that we all know uh, um, are blister plat packs, um, and and I can imagine that the seal is is the important part of the integrity of those packagings. Um, am I correct? Can you give us a little bit more information about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sealing, as you mentioned, is really important, um, especially if you think of uh, sterilized products. And once the seal is is not in a good shape, uh, the sterilization is gone. And uh, this could have also a huge impact uh, on the health of, of the patient. But for sure, also, if you think of about a smooth opening of, of blister packs, this is important. And uh, how a peel-off can be done, this is extremely depends from the material combination of the blister packs. It depends from the machine parameters, but also on the sealed seam and, and the geometries. And the most important value that we want to detect in there is, is the cracking force. Um, but another important point is also how, let's say, regular the sealing is. Um, and that's why there are several tests that are done. And I want to start with the, let's say, testing of the seal strength. This is more or less the, the standard test that it's done. And it's performed on 15 millimeter wide strips with a peel angle of 90 degrees. Um, and there the seal must for sure demonstrate a short, certain, let's say, stiffness, um, depending on the type of packaging that is used. But here's also important to know that this has nothing to do with the reality. So you get values out, you know that about this seal strength. But if you want to have, let's say, the real case of opening a blister pack, you have to do different tests. And these are shown also on the, on the bottom line. So we have a peel test on blister packaging. And therefore, we have designed a, a test kit where you have to clamp, let's say, the, the seal, the lid, and then you peel it off. And this is possible with a test, uh, test kit up to 90 degrees. Um, and here on the left side, we see some bigger packs, blister packaging. It's uh, the clamp has a, an opening width of two millimeter and uh, can go up to 300 Newton. And if you now compare this blister packaging to, to the blister packaging, the primary packaging container for contact lenses, you can imagine that this is a really um, uh, yeah, a smaller piece where you have to grip. And this is exactly the challenge. So we developed another test kit uh, with holding down devices so that they really hold the film in the position. And we have a spring clamp that is used in that case for, for sealing off the material. And this is also done to 90 degrees. So this would be, let's say, the, the peel test for reality. Another important test for, for blister packaging is the push-out tests. And you can imagine if you have uh, some pills or other products you want to push out, uh, this must be possible especially in emergency situations. And therefore, this is also to be tested. And uh, then you, you push on that. And uh, in the middle of that, let's say, blade, there's a hole. So the, the tablet falls down. And uh, one special thing I want to mention, I want to highlight is, let's say, the illumination by a laser pointer. And this allows really easy uh, alignment of the specimen during the testing. Thank you. From from my personal experience, I'm aware of, of child-proof caps, you know, those things you can never uh, do by yourself. And I'm pretty sure we have a solution for that as well. Um, can you share some details with us, please? Uh, this is also an important topic, and uh, I share your 
your personal uh, experience, especially when when having two kids, young kids at home, these childproof caps must be safe. And uh, yes, for sure, we have uh, made a ready-made solution for that, uh, for the, let's say, so-called push and turn test on screw caps. And there we really can, can test the opening torque and later on the functioning of the childproof mechanism. And to do so, we have uh, can also use the Twiki line we have seen uh, on a, on a discussed earlier. But there we have to add a second axis. We have to add a torque axis, and and then we can with the two test axes we can really be independent or make combined axle torsion test as it is required. And uh, then we can test the packaging that is being opened with a rotary movement. And latest, uh, we can really, let's say, be sure that the, that the childproof mechanism works or it fails. Right. Okay. So, uh, well, so so far, then we've we've discussed um, testing solutions for uh, primary packaging. What what about solutions for 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 the secondary or tertiary packaging? Yeah. The the secondary. When we look at the material, so let's say the secondary and the, the tertiary packaging, they are made of paper or, or cardboard, and they should first of all protect the product, but let's say they should also be able that they can be easily removed. Um, and our customers mostly ask for, or mainly ask for um, compression tests on the cardboard packaging. And we have a variety of tests and I brought, let's say, two with us that I would like to demonstrate. So first of all, the determination of the inherent stiffness. And this is extremely important for the packaging manufacturing process. So uh, normally the, the package is, is folded. Oh, it will be folded. It's a flat paper with a predefined uh, lids that must be folded. And we test with that fixture um, let's say the stiffness of the material and it has to withstand uh, a certain uh, force without becoming damaged. Mm -hmm. And on the right side, we see the, the determination of the stacking behavior. So once we have, let's say the final packaging done, it's folded, you can use it. We make a box crest test. Um, there with that box crest test, you can see here two compression plates, we press it together and and based on the force you will get you can really let's say define the the maximum stacking height okay um so hopefully our participants today uh, have had some ideas uh, some uh, ideas what what we can do and how they can uh, approach some of these tests uh, we've seen many different kinds of gripping systems and tools and so on to hold and support specimens all these things are can I say more in the mechanical direction, but I can imagine that software is a vital part of a mechanical testing system uh, and it, in order to ensure that people get reliable uh, test results. Um, I, un I understand that some of the developments that, that, that we um, have come up with contain commercially sensitive information, Jochen, but are you able to share some topics with our participants today? Yeah, I would like to. Um... The point is, we already learned that sample preparation is very important for reliable testing results. And this is all about, so this is what we want to achieve. Um, and, and today, for sure, we can do testing without a software. But uh, if we think of handling all the data we get, um, of doing data analysis, evaluations, I think without software, you, you will agree it's it's impossible. And our Zwick Roll testing software, Test Expert Free, really offers a lot of features um, that guide the user, but also help to protect test data and the test configuration. And uh, out of these features, I, I want to quickly describe four of them, which I think are, are one of the most important ones for reliable test results. So I would like to start with um, the pre-configured standard test programs. So what does it mean? Every every time a customer wants to do a test according to a standard, they used to go into the standard, check which testing requirements are required, and then they have to configure the test. So this means you have to buy the standard, you have to go into the standard, 
read it through, check it. And this is this work we have already done. So that means we have now it's not limited to the number of 600 to the med farm industry. It's so for all industries, but we have for typical standards we have done that work. We have gone through the uh, standards. We have checked what is required. We have set up the the standard test, the configuration. We have prepared the protocol. Said it's let's say it's an easy start for our customer. So this is the one story. <clears throat> the second point is what I would like to mention is the intelligent system configuration builder. So first of all, the purpose of this is to protect our sensors, that they are not being damaged by, by misuse, by false entry of, of uh, uh, data or, or whatever. Um, but it also gives a chance for customers who have to do different kind of tests on different kind of material where different testing requirements, different settings, different sensors are required. So that means they can go into that, um, let's say, once set up the testing configuration, save it, and the next time they, they go to, to do the testing according for that kind of sample, they can just load it and then everything's there. So it's clear which the force limits are correctly set. Um, the uh, the distance from from the thing, the load cell which is required. So quite a lot of things are already there, and and this helps um, a lot in my eyes. The third part is the user management, which I think is also really important in this med farm environment. Um, so it's it's an option which allows the configuration of users, of user groups, but also of user or password guidelines and uh, I, when looking at all the user requirement specification I have seen from customers that are sent to us, uh, this user management really could, could fulfill all the requirements regarding the password guidelines. So this is quite a, a powerful tool. Um, and this is also the, the basis or the prerequisite for going to the next step, for going to the uh, option expanded traceability. And this is an extremely important option once a customer decides to go away from paper-based documentation to electronic-based documentation, and then they have to take care of electronic records, electronic signatures, according to this FDA 21st CFR Part 11, I think this is well known, or to the EU GMP guidelines Annex 11. Um, and there it's really important that everything is documented. So the actions are protocol in an audit trail that can be reviewed later on also during an, an FDA audit. And in this audit trail, we really go that way that is indicates when does who do what, why, and who is responsible. So all the different actions are locked in and, and this is quite a, a powerful tool as, as well with a lot of ad administration possibilities. Thank you, Jochen. I think um... I think we were right to discuss software then. It's pretty clear how important that whole environment is in terms of controlling a test machine and also at the same time um, handling all the regulations and all the documentation and traceability that we need. Um, so Jochen, I'd like to thank you for sharing your insights uh, today. Um, I, I've definitely found it very interesting and I hope our participants did too. We, we do have a few moments for some questions and um, I'm going to try and have a look and see if I can find a couple here which would be um, interesting for everybody. Um, Jochen, question one I've chosen says, uh, uh, blister out of a deep drawn rigid plastic part uh, with a flexi flexible cover. Do you have any uh, is, are there recommendations for gripping the, the plastic part? Mm. Um, yeah, this this uh, could definitely be be a challenge, and we also had to experience it. Um, and if this gripping is not possible at all, so also based on the on the knowledge we have in our application test lab, uh, we very often go to double side tapes um, or even to to tools with uh, with some vacuum that hold the package uh, later on in place. Ah, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, second question um, for tensile test on mask band. So that was the band on, on the on the face mask. 
um, I think. Is there a recommendation for a, a, a method? Mm. It's also a, a, qu a good question. So we have done it um, according to the same test, um, like for the tensile test on the whole samples. Um, we this we have not found, let's say, um, so it's I think it's, it's ASTM D534, where you cut some, some samples out of it, and we just did it like that. Um, the mechanical test is really limited, and you have to really dig dive in in the in the standards. And and I think this is what we what we took, let's say, at least for that example. And and the question is also later on, which uh, which method is requested from from let's say from the customers or from the auditors when you go for the approval. This is something okay. I would I would recommend to check to to go in discussion okay. with the with the auditor and and. Uh, for the approval to to get input, which standard shall apply or which method? Thank you, Jochen. Um, next question is: uh, is is there a hardness test for the plastic shield? Yeah, plastic shield. Let's say um, I think that the question is about the face shield, and that's what I assume. Yeah. Um, the the hardness. Let's say when you look at the standards, it's ISO 16900. Um, when when you go into that, there's uh, only described that drop test with a with a steel ball that falls down, and and there must be some some uh, it must be done under certain temperature uh, environments. I think there must be a uh, the first test is by five degrees, the second one by f uh, 30 degrees plus minus, I guess two, and and this is the drop test that is done, uh, a height of 150. I I, I have in mind. Uh, I have not seen a, a hardness test, but for sure I can also, um, let's say a drop test has an impact on that face shield, and for sure a hardness is also uh, about, gives an information about how how good it can resist for penetration. But this standard where what I have shown, this has no hardness test in it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one, maybe two more. Um, question is, um, I have many different tests uh, which I have, which have to be done on packaging materials. Uh, do you have any advice about setting up these different tests? Yeah, I at the moment it's really difficult because I do not know the test in detail. Um, I know that I there's it a means huge that, uh, variety. Uh, uh, Sorry? I, I was just trying to interpret. I, th I think it might be the, the focus is on many different kinds of tests, mm -hmm. possibly. Yeah, well, so changing, maybe, changing some tools and changing something. Mm -hmm. And maybe what, what could be interesting is, um, let's say, our toolbox solution. So what is it? It's uh, so we also have learned that they want to try something out. Uh, so we prepared, let's say, uh, some some box where we have different kind of components in. It's also a part of our standards catalog, um, which you might address to to your salespersons in in the region. So and this really allows um, an easy laying around of building up flexible test setups. Uh, it has uh, also, let's say, the the spring clamp that I showed, or a screw grip is in, and and a lot of other, let's say, flexible parts, which which could could help in that matter. But for sure, to to give a more detailed answer, we really need to understand which kind of packaging um, is tested, what kind of tests must be done. Thank you, Jochen. Um, perhaps I could take the chance to summarize uh, now uh, what I I took from this um, webinar today. So so Jochen, I think you uh, you've explained. Um, something about the Zwick role experience over a long period of time with regard to personal protective equipment, PPE as we call it, medical textiles, medical pharmaceutical uh, packaging. And, and I specifically um, noted that, that, you know, that, that, you, that you're working together with lead, the leading medical companies um, and having the experience of, of doing very complex things um, with those people. You, you also I think showed us some interesting applications, which is good. I think from a show, you know, showing a, a quite big range of, of products and, and, and so on. Um, I noted that you said 
uh, we have standard products, but you're also more than happy to customize uh, these uh, these these uh, products depending if if what the customer actually wants to do. So I think um, as well, um, what I what I find interesting was that. Um, Zwick, Zwick role is it seems to be very well aware of uh, the, the requirements of the laws the regulations the guidelines and we saw that with the, the software uh, that you showed earlier on and the, the, the way of handling the information so that the software which controls the machine also whilst having to, to, to deal with all the documentation and all the traceability which is which is uh, complex also makes uh, makes the job for the operator very or as easy as, as possible with, with standard programs and standard routines and so on. So you can. Um, uh, that's what I, I took out of that. I hope I didn't miss anything. Would you like to? Would you like to add anything else, which would be a kind of take home for for our participants today? Yeah, for sure. I think you did a, a great summary. Uh, I think you covered most of the points. Um, one point I would like to to mention. Uh, we, we are really happy to, to support you with testing equipment, but also advice and consultancy regarding testing, but also, let's say, meeting the regulations, if it's, uh, let's say, uh, focused on materials testing and also test applications. Um, maybe one thing I can, can mention, we also have a application test lab in, in Germany, uh, where we have a, a lot of experience, a lot of equipment where, where we can do uh, pre-testing or, or even demonstrations. I know that to, in these days with COVID-19, it's difficult to travel. So uh, also uh, demonstration via the web would be an option or even go for contract testing um, to, to support you in if you have uh, uh, urgent needs of, of getting something tested. And finally, in the end, our sales and service uh, organizations worldwide uh, are really happy to, to support you. And I, I really uh, ask you to to challenge them to to get in touch with them if you have a a testing need regarding PPE regarding textiles regarding packaging and and we we're really curious to learn about your testing requirements. Thank you, Jochen. So that's it. Thank you very much. I think uh, very useful um, information for us all there. Thank you once again, Jochen, for sharing your experience and, and the insights. Um, I'd like to thank all the participants today for their attention. Um, please stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in the next webinar.